Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe, and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? All right, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Ignited Recovery Secrets Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe, and I'm here to you with a special guest today that you're going to get to hear in just a little bit. Her name is Ruby Warrington. You know, 10, damn, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was still at UCLA, starting to do research and starting to look into alternatives, ways of um, considering addiction and recovery and the the whole idea of non-abstinence or harm reduction or really any approach, even the abstinence approaches that were not 12-step based, smart recovery, SOS, life ring, et cetera. Like when I was just starting to look into this 12 years ago, um, it was lonely. It was lonely. It took me took me months and actually maybe even a year or two to find other practitioners who had been around, spoke like I um, do, etc. And so we actually just recently did a harm reduction top 10 list, only of the, the ones who are alive. There are still other incredible people who are not included in that list. It's just a top 10 list that we created. Uh, but some of the people on that list, like um, Stanton Peel and Andrew Tatarski and um, Tom Horvath and Dee Dee Stout and Pat Denning, et cetera, were some of the people that I was looking to um, but the point is it was lonely. It was lonely. There were not a lot of people who were thinking this way. Definitely not a lot of people who were speaking publicly and out loud about a different way to look at mental health. Gabor Mate was, um, had his book, uh, you know, in the realm of hungry ghosts. And there's, you know, it was, you had to dig really, 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 really deeply. I'm happy to report that over the last, I don't know, I guess, five, six years, definitely since we opened Alternatives back in the day, my ex-partner and I opened up Alternatives here in Beverly Hills and ran a treatment center that worked with these same principles. Over these last seven years, I've definitely noticed a shift. And it's been nice because for some of you who listen, you write me directly about how reading the Abstinence Myth book or taking the course or listening to this podcast or just being exposed to what Sophie and I do on Instagram, how you've known that there needed to be another solution and nothing else spoke to you. You've tried it over and over and it just didn't work and how refreshing and uplifting it is and hopeful to have another way of looking at things. Since then, more and more opportunities have come up. More and more different ways of people looking at this issue have come up. And the beauty of it is, if you know me well, I'm not dogmatic on any specific method being the right one. I love Ignited Recovery. And I think if what you're looking for is hope and purpose, if what you're looking for is to become the best version of yourself that you can be, not just to look at your substance use and your addiction problems, but if, you know, just literally looking at how to become the best human that you can be, I'm a big believer, obviously, in the fact that what we do at Ignited is amazing for that. That's not everybody's cup of tea. Tea is not everybody's cup of tea, right? Sometimes people want something different that speaks to them. So I've had Annie Grace on here. Um, do we? I don't know if we did a podcast with her. I've had her on our Wednesday podcast before for sure. She's had me on hers. Um, she has a couple of amazing books now, This Naked Mind and The 30 Day Alcohol Experiment. And what I bring you today is Ruby's version of that, Ruby Warrington's version of that in her new book, Sober Curious. And we talk pretty openly about a completely different way of approaching things. And Ruby's version of things is not mine, right? Um, While she talks about and looks at the deeper core issues, for her, it's more about just plain old curiosity. What would my life look like if? Um, And for some of you, that might be really refreshing exactly what you were looking for. And so, you know, listen, pay attention, Take the nuggets that Ruby shares on here, which are powerful. If you're 
considering, thinking, you know somebody who's considering, thinking about the potential of changing their daily habits. Um, we'll have links to everything down below. And I really urge you, whether it's my message who speaks to, that speaks to you or somebody else's or Ruby's or Annie's or anybody else, um, we all have choices now. You know, 12, 15 years ago, it was like a black hole. You couldn't get access to these things. Going online wouldn't, wouldn't deliver anything other than the most traditional, old school, 100-year-old ways of looking at this problem. But there's a different way of looking at things now. And so I really urge you to look deeply. I'm going to keep bringing that to you here. Ruby's bringing it to you in her own style. Um, you know, people always ask me at the end of interviews, what is your message? The message in the end is there's always hope. You just have to find an approach that speaks to you, that you align with, and then start doing the work. I hope you really enjoy this interview. And don't forget to take a screenshot, leave us a review, um, DM us, tell us what it is that you like about these so we can keep delivering more of what works for you. Bye. We've all been hearing about the microbiome and how important it is for our health. It's kind of funny, right? Only 10 years ago, we believed that killing the bacteria on everything was the way to go. I mean, do you remember those sanitizer sprays everywhere? And now we're gradually learning that, surprise, surprise, not really, we actually need the bacteria around us to thrive and even survive. The thing is that everybody's been focusing almost exclusively on the bacteria in your body that helps you digest food. And that is really important because if you can't digest it, you can't live off of the nutrients and then you develop all sort of GI problems and you have to... Never mind. But research has been showing us an incredible connection between bacteria in your gut and your mental health. Seriously. For instance, studies have shown that the bacteria in the gut of an animal can change its level of depression. And more and more research is coming out showing that the same exact thing probably plays a role in anxiety, depression, maybe even autism and ADHD. Isn't that amazing? So I did some research and I decided to add a probiotic mix that helps not only mood, but also the communication between my gut and the brain. It's called Amare and their wellness kit takes care of everything that I need. The probiotics that have been researched to provide actual tangible help and the prebiotics and everything that those bacteria need to thrive and do their work. I've been using it myself for three months and I gotta say, it's really helped regulate my mood and keep me even. And it's helping me feel less foggy too, especially in the morning. Look, these guys really did their research and this stuff is top notch. If you wanna get it for yourself, just follow the link in our show notes and you can join the Mind Biome Revolution with me. All right, everybody. Um, Ignited Recovery Secrets. We are in the house with Ruby, Ruby Warrington, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Ruby just recently wrote a book, a book called Sober Curious. And uh, the book kind of started making the rounds in my circle of people. Um, it is a, it's a pretty small recovery world, especially when you're not coming directly from like the 12-step angle which you're still not in the you know in the overall kind of industry scheme of things almost everything that comes at recovery the content is uh is 12 step based and has been for a long time and so now there's more and more stuff that's coming out that is not that your book is one of those and so it entered my my sphere and that's why i thought this would be a really interesting conversation um and so before we get into it because i think this will be a really cool conversation once we get into all the, the depths of everything you mentioned right before we started talking how this issue of even dealing with alcohol came up for you so why don't we tell everybody about that yeah cool hi well thank you for having me i'm really happy to be here to talk to you about this um i i got what i call sober curious about nine years ago um and really that was a very internal process what do you mean by that internal meaning a lot of inner questioning nothing i was vocalizing around mm, is alcohol making me feel more bad than it's making me feel good why weren't you talking to other people about it um i was i was afraid 
actually, that if I started talking about this, that if I vocalized the fact that I wasn't really enjoying drinking or that I felt like alcohol was having a negative impact on me and yet I continue to drink, I I thought that that meant I was an alcoholic and that the immediate response from anybody I vocalized this to would be, well, now you have to quit. quit. In fact, you have to go to AA. You obviously have a problem and you have to quit. And that was, um, that I describe it in my book as um, kind of like standing on the edge of a sheer cliff face, the feeling of being like, okay, well, it's this or it's that, it's this or it's that, you know? It didn't seem like there was any kind of a middle ground and that was intimidating. Okay, I love that because I tell people all the time that there's a really common phrase in the recovery industry, which is, well, if you're, qu- if you're wondering about it, then you are an mm-hmm, alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And that's fucking insane to me, honestly. <laughs> I know you're British, so I hope you're, not, you're okay with I the- swear all the time, good, it's good, great. Good. I'm glad we uh, got that up there. Yeah, up front. it's done. It's done. Uh, <laughs> and you live in New York, so people, I do. that's not a problem yeah. there either. But there's no other area in life where that is true. Mm. There's not like, you know, I wonder if I like bison. Well, now you're a bison eater. Like, no, that's not, <laughs> you know, I wonder if I'm good at math or if I could write. Well, now you're right. Like, mm. we, we are allowed to test mm. concepts, let alone personas that we want to take on all the time. In other areas, there are probably some exceptions to that, right? Like as I'm thinking about it, like sexual orientation and things like that also fall into this mm. this same place. Like if you even question it, then you're probably gay or you're probably bi mm-hmm, or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest blocks for people to actually see what something different would look like. Because yeah. if I think about it, and then you don't let yourself think about it either, right? Because it's like... Well, if I'm still thinking about it, then that mu- means I must I'm be really as well. An alcoholic. It doesn't matter that I'm not even drinking that much. The fact I'm thinking about alcohol this amount means that I'm addicted and you know I'm having these obsessive thoughts. Yeah. So you were having those nine years ago. You started. When did you start yeah. first start vocalizing anything? Nine years ago, I started the questioning, and that was about a year and a half before I moved to New York, which was a big break point in my life. I it obviously really shook up my career, my social life, my family life, like everything. It was a bit of a clean slate moment because everybody was in England. Uh, because I was leaving everybody behind in England, apart from my husband, who I moved to New York with. And that was a real, that that was the point when I started not necessarily vocalizing this in those terms, but certainly seeking out opportunities to socialize, to build a community that wasn't, re- that didn't revolve around alcohol. Growing mm. up in the UK, any UK listeners, I mean, you, everybody knows this, right? About us Brits drinking so, beer down the pub but from 4 p.m. in the afternoon is just like part of the national character. I have so many people who just tell me, well, I'm an alcoholic because I'm British or I'm okay. Irish. <laughs> it's like, that is not true. That but is anyway, not true. Yeah. Anyway, 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 it's it's difficult to avoid the drinking culture in the UK as it is in many kind of like cities, same, similar in New York actually. But my experience of moving to New York, I very much got involved quickly in the more kind of emotional, spiritual wellness scene, which is like what my other work is all about. The numinous. The numinous. And so I radically, I began to really radically reduce the amount that I was actually drinking, Oh, but still would have these thoughts, still would find myself in certain groups of people and in certain situ- situations, drinking to the point that I would wake up feeling pretty crappy the next day, a lingering hangover that would last a few days. And okay. again, back in this questioning of like, why am I still doing this? Why am I still doing this to myself? Can I ask some specifics? So mm. what were you drinking like before you started reducing? Before I, before I started reducing, I was drinking never more than two nights in a row. Um, probably three or four nights a week, a um, couple of glasses of wine with dinner, bit of a binge at the weekend, you know, um, yeah, so, no, no more, no, nothing to be like alarm bells. So moderate to high, moderate, moderate to consumer. heavy social drinker. Okay. Yeah. And never on my own. And then like when you reduced, what did it look like? When I reduced, it was probably more like once every couple of weeks. Okay. But then maybe but like then one of those like would be like a bit of a binge. Yeah, okay. exactly. Cool. It's interesting. I don't really tend to talk specifics. Well, the reason I ask often. is people always ask. So they, they do. They try to measure what they're drinking exactly, like by other people. Exactly, which is why I don't really talk about it. Because I'm like, this was. This is not about how much I was drinking necessarily. It was about the impact it was having on my life. I measure it by the impact it was having. Of course. Rather than the actual volume of consumption yep. but i completely appreciate it. it's, it's it's interesting to hear right and it is interesting to have a measure yeah it's called norming it's like the idea of well how what is my consumption like anyway i have some more, I have some more it, questions right about it after. i i thought well my consumption is actually way less than most of the people i did my drinking with 
uh, and really not by the kind of like common standards, like anything, like I said, to be alarmed at, which was sort of what kept me questioning long, longer, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, there's some questions I have about, I mean, it kept me in a position of like, well, it, this can't be a problem because it's less than everybody else. And it's like, you know, okay, I get it. Um, I mean, it's funny, like, the, I, it can't be a problem. Anything could be a problem. Mm. Even if nobody else thinks that it is, if it bothers you, exactly. it's a problem, right? Exactly. Um, the reason I'm saying it is I, I do have a question because, you know, when I was reading uh, little segments and kind of picking things out, I always wonder, and the reason I was asking about the reduction of what it looked like for you mm. is I always wonder why the vast majority, because that, that's not the way my thinking goes, so that's why I wonder about it, why the vast majority of books, articles, things that get written are about like, should you take alcohol out of your life or should you keep it in? Which I still see as a little black and white mm. overall. So I wanted to see what your journey was like mm. to black and white. But what I understand is you had a certain level of drinking, which was by me by average measures, again, on the moderate to high level mm -hmm. of drinking among the general population. Mm. Among in normal drinking, right? Yeah, again, I don't, <laughs> I, there, is, there is no measure of alcoholic drinking. Like it just yeah. doesn't exist. There's. I was doing air quotes. I'm just letting people were. know. Well, no, I said no. normal. <laughs> and, and the reason I don't even say alcoholic drinking is, I mean, you can look that up online. There is no measure of alcoholic drinking. Nobody knows what that is. Yeah. There's heavy drinking. Yeah. And heavy drinking is anything essentially for a man over 14, anything for over seven for women. But those numbers get debated all the time. So mm. it's like, I just wanted to understand what your standard was. And then you went down, but you went substantially down and mm. it just wasn't enough for you. And what I'm understanding now is the next break. So it's like, yes. I was drinking this much and now yes. I'm drinking a lot less. Cool. The, on, the only other option that you saw was completely eliminating it. Completely eliminating. I just needed to understand your yeah. journey. So um, I did at that point... I went to a couple of AA meetings. I have a many, many friends in recovery and thought, okay, I have nothing to lose by checking this out. Cool. Um, but what I found in those spaces was not my story. I wasn't hearing or seeing my story and my journey reflected in what I was hearing. And I felt like an imposter. And I know tons of people say that, but I just thought, you know, I'm kind of beyond this. Maybe if I'd have got, maybe if I'd have got to AA like a few years before, it would have been exactly what I needed. But by that point, I had proven to myself through experience and repeated kind of questioning curiosity around this, yeah. um, that I was not behold, I wasn't powerless over alcohol. So why would you even say that maybe that was what you would have needed a couple of years earlier? Why not yeah. say, why not say they would have, they would have, I would have bought in. Maybe I would have been. Earlier. Maybe I would have been quicker to buy in a couple of years earlier because I wouldn't have been through. I wouldn't have walked through enough of the fire on my own. Because in this to book, prove you don't, to myself. In this book, you don't talk about yourself as an alcoholic. No, and I don't label myself as an alcoholic. And so, if you would have bought in a couple of years earlier, you right. would have put that label on. You would have put just put the alcoholic you know what? jacket now on. Now that you're actually saying it, I don't think I ever would have put that label on. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good, because I think too many people do. Just because it's the only option. Well, to fit in. Yeah, right. Because the other group of people, the group of people that is tell, trying to help you, tells you you're an alcoholic and you don't want to reject another group of people because you just left all your drinking friends behind. Mm. And you go, shit, to fit into those people, I have to admit that I'm an alcoholic because otherwise they don't let me talk. And also fitting in is why we drink. I mean, it's what we do as humans. So, so people go from, I'm a normal person who drinks too much to I'm an alcoholic who's trying not to drink. And it's like this black or white world. I'm one or the other. And so one of the reasons I like sober curious, I call it absent and sampling is what mm. I is what I call sober mm. curious. Mm. But um, the reason I like it, if for no other reason, is it gives people another option mm. of something to do instead of the thing that was going on in your head for years, which yeah, is, right. are you an alcoholic or not? Yeah. Well, what if I just don't like drinking as much as I think I should? Yeah. And I just want to try something else out. Yeah. There's like, there's no option for that. There's no option. Exactly. So you went to so the I meetings, went to didn't two, really like I went it. to two meetings, didn't really like it, but I realized, but what I did realize, there was a sense of relief in going, okay, let me, I, I need to at least just talk to someone about this, you know? And so- Being able to I be kind open. Of, yeah, and... just being able to be open with it. And um, that was the point I started talking to friends about it because I knew there were certain friends in my circle who I just got the sense were feeling the same way I How was. How long ago was this? This was in 2015. Okay. Beginning like Jan or Feb 2015. Um, and so... Is saying Jan or Feb the thing now? Jan or Feb as opposed to I what? I said January, like instead of finishing the word. Oh, You're like the second maybe. or third person I just heard doing that this week. It's so Jan or Feb. Oh, no I one's think, got time I, to say February. I think Maddie might have done it. Maddie did it and I'm like, is that, did I miss like a memo? Is there, we just don't... Get with the program. I, 
Anyway, we so. don't say those. We don't, <laughs> we don't finish. We off just like them. one syllable. No more syllables than absolutely necessary. <laughs> I love no it. one has time for that. No one has time for syllables. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, so that was 2015. And then I started talking to a few friends in my circle about it. Just kind of one-on-one, just kind of like, what the hell? Like, God, ew, this doesn't feel good. Like, why do I still sometimes drink? And like, seriously, like two glasses of wine gives me a three-day hangover. What is that all about? Really? Okay. You know? Wow. Okay. It was that kind of a vibe. Cool. I think because... Well, just to kind of give you a bit more context yeah. about my life at the time, it was while I was beginning to um, establish my online magazine, The Numinous, which covers every aspect of modern spirituality and lots of ideas about alternative healing and wellness. And I was, through creating this project, engaging in many of these practices. And not only was I finding all these other amazing ways to get high, and by saying by get high, I mean say you know ways to relax, to unwind, to connect with other people, to transcend, to breathing, meditation, all these, all the practices, all the tools, having these amazing transportive experiences that required no substances and left me feeling amazing. Plus, I was healing a bunch of my shit. (laughs) So alcohol wasn't giving me. Pay attention to the last sentence. Plus, I was healing Healing a bunch bunch of my my shit. shit. And you weren't needing the alcohol to run away as much anymore. Wasn't bringing me pleasure anymore. The pleasure I was kind of like wasn't getting the pleasure part because the the again quote unquote pleasure was so two dimensional and flat and numb feeling versus the pleasure I was getting from these other experiences. And then so all I was experiencing was the the after effect, which just felt so painful. Yeah. Considering how good I was feeling the rest of the time. So um, I after about another year I decided that I wanted to start hosting events and kind of like, cause the, by kind of just com- communing with a few people in my circle, I realized that actually way more people than ever feel comfortable talking about it, a feeling that way, a doing that internal questioning and Hey, wouldn't it be great if we could actually get together in a way that wasn't dogmatic like AA, but actually just kind of acknowledge that many more of us than we ever would um, realize are actually questioning the dominant drinking culture and our place in it. In the events, would you talk about the drinking or would you just hang out not drinking? Yeah, well, that was a conscious decision to make them specifically, let's talk about the drinking. Okay. Because there are other other kind of alcohol-free events that don't, they just kind of like don't have alcohol and they're like, but they don't specifically say- we're here to address drinking or to like bring that up. But um, I partnered with someone called Biet Simkin, who you may be familiar with. She's a meditation coach and she has a recovery background. And I wanted to partner with someone from that background because at the time I was really nervous that this was dangerous. Like other messaging that talking about a different path to sobriety or talking about abstinence, not necessarily being the only option would be endangering individuals who were on a very precarious path with that you know so get, some I, of the messaging i had internalized was like this is a dangerous oh, you conversation it. okay because i get from other people i get that message all the time right just today i got a message from somebody telling me how like crazy i am for even suggesting that people should have some measure of control over what they do in their life and i go i, I want to see what yours was internalized because i don't know that i had any of that when i recovered like I was sober for three years, mm-hmm. completely sober, and mm-hmm. it, my meth was my main addiction. But mm-hmm. I did a lot of other stuff, like whatever mm-hmm. I felt like, and um, and now I'm not 100 percent sober. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I left, I bought in to the notion that, that yeah, that it's dangerous. Like if you the, if the you leave the door open slope, a crack, all that it's stuff. gonna at some point they're gonna you're gonna fall back through or whatever. But then here's yeah. my question to you, right? Because you're in this holistic world the more eastern the more energy driven world and without a doubt one of the most predominant messages in that world is the thoughts you let in the reality you create in your head is the reality you live in mm. right is not that mm. like wouldn't you that say is that, a, that is one it's thing one of the kind of about. core yeah. you create your messages. own reality yeah and the you know an, law yeah. of attraction quantum yeah. physics all that that world mm. um and so a lot of times i wonder whether we're just we're actually living a lie in that context and we just we have persuaded ourselves that if you leave the door open then there's a slippery slope to go down versus the opposite which sounds to me like what your actual journey was and that is oh i'm not really liking alcohol that much anymore let me see what being without it is like oh let me talk to other people about it oh there's more people who feel the same way let's all get together and talk about it which seems like a very low pressure version very low pressure and super sustainable and here's the other curious thing about that right oh and let me let me sample alcohol with this questioning mind 
so that I can better educate myself about the nature of the beast and how it truly impacts me. And then from that decision, oh shit, actually it makes me good feel good for 20 minutes, but makes me feel shit for two days. That's not something I can buy into anymore. Sorry, yep. no. And make the decision from that place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give an example <laughs> that I did not think I was going to use today. So like alcohol doesn't do that for me, for instance, right? Which is probably why I still drink is mm. I don't have an effect. I mean, first of all, I, I rarely drink more than like two drinks on, mm. a, on an occasion ever. Mm. Um, so I just don't really have much of a of an effect, but I can't. Sorry for everybody listening right now that I'm going to use this example, but <laughs> you know how everybody talks about crack being really addictive, right? They do. Okay. I've never tried it, so I wouldn't know. Good. I'm going to tell a funny story right now. <laughs> so back in the day, I used to sell drugs. I don't know if you know any of my No, my I don't. Background, but I used to sell drugs and um, we sold everything. Mm -hmm. Coke, meth, GHB, acid, mushrooms, a lot of ecstasy, and a lot of meth. And um, we were selling a lot of cocaine, like pounds and pounds and kilos of cocaine. And so one of the guys that was working for me, like one of my runners, one of the guys who would go out and sell for me, really liked free base cocaine or crack. So he would always take the stuff that we got, which was like straight from Colombia, like, mm. like Pablo Escobar cocaine. Mm -hmm. And he would cook it in, at a recording studio. He would just cook it and he would smoke it. And I'd always heard about cocaine crack being really addictive. I don't really like regular cocaine, like snorting it. And one time he gives it to me. I can't believe I'm telling you this story on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, one time he gives it to me. And back in those days, the thought of, I probably shouldn't try this because I heard it's really addictive, never crossed my mind. I was always fucked up for like five straight years. If you were thinking sober. that way, you wouldn't have probably been selling drugs. That's a good, good fair point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was probably high on meth when he gave right. me the, co the cocaine to try. So I smoke it. And it gave me a weird little like head rush for 30, 45 seconds or something. And then I went out with my day. And I remember talking to a friend of mine because I, I never really had much of the um, social, social awareness stigma of what I'm allowed to talk about and what I'm not mm. allowed to talk about, which is probably why I'm telling the story right now, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, and I walk into a friend of mine's store, which was like a head shop in Westwood. And I tell him that I just tried this stuff out and I go, I don't get it. Like... I felt the effect for 45 seconds and I've been depressed for like three hours since. Okay. Who does this shit? <laughs> like, why would anybody want to use a drug where you use it, you get high for a minute and then you're depressed for hours? And it was the only time I ever tried it because it didn't produce an effect. Very interesting. The place where you landed with an alcohol mm. was, had nothing to do with crack, but it was mm. the same sort of mindset. Like mm. you're going, wait, let me try this. Mm. Oh, I kind of like it for 20 minutes. And then for days, I feel like shit. Why would I want to do that? Why would I do that? I don't have time for that. I that don't have is, time for that in my life. But that is a very different place than I'm an alcoholic. I suffer from some chronic disease that disturbs my being and I need to forever watch out. It's also a very different place from oh, there's this substance in the world that is so fucking amazing. I can't touch it or I'm not going to be able to stop. Very different. Like the totally. opposite place yeah. to that, actually. So... <laughs> there are probably a lot of other things that you don't do in life because you don't like them. Yes. And it's not, it's not a big deal. No. Like, do you eat a lot of meat? I don't eat meat. Well, they, you say, and do you no. walk around going, Oh fuck man, I can't just wait. I to used to eat meat okay. and now I don't eat meat. And I've educated myself about all the reasons not to eat meat. And I've, listen to my body and I've gone, body, do you like meat? And it says no. And now when I think about eating meat, I feel like a cannibal and it makes me feel nauseous and sick. So not a problem. Not a problem. Cool. Yeah. So that's, I, I talk to people about I think this. meat is an interesting co comparison to this actually, because the, to, meet, to eat meat in our society is very much the norm. It's the dominant sort of like behavior, you know? Yeah, in some ways and it's to, a sign to of- And to of, step outside of that, you're often ridiculed. You're made to feel like an outsider. You're a second class citizen in restaurants. It's, yeah. Yeah. Again, personal choices, right? Like I am, I eat meat. Like I grew up on a Mediterranean diet pretty much my entire life growing up in Israel. Mm. And so meat is part of my diet, but it's not like a, it's not 50% of my, I don't know what percentage of my, it's not a- I don't eat like meat and potatoes. It's not like that clear that I eat meat. But um, but Sophie eats substantially less meat than I do. I mean, I don't even know when she eats red meat, but <laughs> you know, she'll eat fish and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So what I love about what you're talking about through your story is this is more of a process of self-discovery exactly. than it is a process of recognizing the error of your ways and flagellating yourselves for... Um, for being a sinner and how dare I had wasted all those years and, 
and betrayed myself for、uh, for alcohol. It's also a, a point of recognizing, hey, there have been points in my life when it's been really hard to feel joy and to feel relaxed and to feel transcendent. And of course, I wanted to use alcohol for those things. It was presented to me. In fact, it was. Shoved in my face as the way I to experience those things, and so of course I used it. Like of course, yeah, I did. It, of course, we do use the all of these substances. We all want to experience what they purport to give us. Yeah, and there are some. There are often problematic side effects. Yeah. Um. So you did your experiment. You、mm-hmm. came up with a group.、Uh, mm, Club Soda NYC. Okay. Oh, so you you have the so you started the. New York chapter of Club Soda. Well, it's. Not, I didn't realize there was a UK Club Soda until about a year after I'd been running、no、my、way. New York Club Soda. That's hilarious. So we we spell it a bit. How coincidental is that? Spell it out differently, and we always include the NYC. And ours stands for sober or debating abstinence.、Mm. <laughs> it's so hugely coincidental. Yeah, that's. But Laura、crazy. is awesome. Laura, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> yeah, 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 I totally. That's so. That's hilarious. I know. Wow! Yeah, so that was Biet and myself, and the events would always include some kind of a meditation, often some kind of an interactive meditation experience, panel discussions. We had dance parties,、um, fun games for people to play. Just yeah, fun events to that revolved around this conversation. Sober or debating absence.、Mm. So that sounds like there are members of this crew that you started.、Mm. Can I call them a crew? Is that okay? Yeah, a crew. Yeah. Um, back to the hip hop days and break dancing of the eighties,、um, which I was not at all a part of because I was born in seventy six. But me too. Oh, really? When's your birthday? August twenty seventh. April eighth. Okay.、Um, so there, are people were questioning, or people who are、mm. dabbling in abstinence,、mm. right? Because I, again, I talk about it as amp- abstinence sampling. I like that. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking, you know, I don't really know if I like what alcohol does in my life. Let me take a week off.、Mm-hmm. What does it do? And actually, a lot of times, what people that I work with recognize is, oh, it was masking other stuff.、Mm. And once we help do the work on the other stuff, alcohol、mm. just matters less.、Mm, exactly. It's not that. Yeah. So, like, I drink when I feel like it. I don't drink when I don't feel like it. Sophie will point out to me times for sure. Well, I say it times, but it's happened once. <laughs> One time in our fourteen-year relationship, Sophie said to me, "Hey, you're drinking more than usual." And I went, oh, interesting. And then I knew to look back at why is that happening, and I realized I was really stressed out at work. Yeah, right. And so I started adjusting things and took a month off to kind of reset. Because when you take the bandage off, the wound is there. Is there, and, and it's more visible. And you go, yes. Oh, I need to pay attention to、it、that. Requires、thing. attention. And、mm. and so I did that. I did the month off, and I kind of looked at it, and I went, okay, I put more things in place, and then. I went back. Now I actually take a month off every year.、Mm-hmm. Also, I do dry January just、mm-hmm. to make sure that I'm on it. Like that, I know if I'm really using it to cover something up,、mm-hmm. then then it comes out in that month.、Mm-hmm. The stress, the anxiety, just rears its ugly head,、mm-hmm. and and it's sort of so it's an ongoing process of discovery that I go through. You know,、so、I like that. I, I'm constantly learning, and so you do have people. It sounds like who sample absolutely. I sample myself, like. It's funny. People always say to me, "Are you sober?" And I say, "No, I'm not sober, but I don't drink." <laughs> and that's partly I sometimes smoke cannabis, very rarely, maybe like once a month or something. I get so paranoid. And the teeniest bit, I can barely inhale. Like otherwise, it's like, like me. Yeah, like I, the muscle relaxant effect. Yes, please. But if it goes any deeper than that, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, I sit there in the corner. I'm like, it's not good. I can't. What, I can't say anything. I feel paranoid. It's ridiculous. So also, and I also say that because, for example, my best friend got married in Ibiza in June, and I had like half a glass of wine at her, champ- her glass of champagne at her、yep. wedding. I had had food poisoning the day before, and so、mm. actually, it felt doubly icky.、Yeah. I probably would have had more, a couple more glasses if that hadn't if happened. Good, but it could, physically was causing me pain as I drank it, so I didn't drink. Um, but I had some. If I was in recovery, that would have been a relapse, and I'd have been back to square one. And the shame Fucking, and the self-flagellation hate, that would have come with it. I hate that way of thinking.、Mm. We list. We recently wrote an article on psychology today. I put a link to it、um, in the show notes. And did I just do an episode on it? I don't remember. We did something else on exactly this point. It's like, ah,、uh, I mean, those of you who are in recovery. And you had years and are listening right now. Like I talk to people all the time. I had eight years. I ask them how much time do you have because that's a question、mm. you ask people in recovery. How much、mm. time do you have? And、mm. they all they all know it. It's like、mm. I have、uh, you know six and a half years. I go okay, cool. And when we talk about the rest of their stuff and the rest of their stories, they say, well, I had eight years before, but then I relapsed. I go, so why don't? So you just write that off? Like 
those eight years are just gone. As far, mm. Well, you know, I, I drank for a whole month. It was really a mess. I go, where else in life have you messed up for a month over a period of 14 years, 14 and a half years, and you just write off eight of those? Like, why not? To me, part of it is the removal of accountability again. It's like, mm. I don't know about take pride. That might be a, the, the wrong verbiage to use here, but like own the eight years you had before for all their wins, all the losses, all the learning you did during that time, all the things you didn't a- address because that's why you drank again. Mm. Something showed back up for you. Mm. Own it. Like own it and say, I've got 14 years of sobriety with a month in the middle where I drank. Mm-hmm. Sophie and I have been together for 14 years. We were broken up for a year in the middle. Like <laughs> the, the two years we were together, a year and a half we were together before, it's not, it's not that it doesn't exist. Yeah, right. It's a part of our relationship. Yeah. So you have been in this state, what do you call it? Sober curious. Okay, so you've been sober curious for- well, I would say I've been sober curious doing the questioning for nine years. There you go. Because I don't really have a, po- there wasn't a point when I stopped drinking. It's just been gradually less and less and less to the point now where I just don't even think about it. It's just not even yeah. a part of, it's not even something I think about anymore. Yeah. If it shows up in front of you and you're in a place where you want to try some, you try some. And if it shows up in front of you and you're not, you don't. And exactly. It's like, I think literally just the, the removal of judgment from the whole equation mm. probably makes- you feel better in the entire process. Totally. And that's one thing that consistently people have said about this book is that it's just so judgment free. I'm like, you know what? You're doing your best. Just be, have integrity. That's all I say is like, have integrity. Just know when you know when you're doing it for whatever reason, know your reasons why and have integrity with that reason. And yeah. like from there, you're doing your best. That's so great. I mean, in my, it's funny because in the Absinthe Smith book, I literally call it a shame-free, judgment-free, rules-free um, way to beat addiction. We have a copy for you. Thank you very um, much. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. And I, it's like, a, it's more like a manual. I actually, yeah, perfect. I, I don't, I put a lot of like exercises at the end of every chapter and stuff like that, but it's, mm. it's literally like a self-help, really thick booklet almost. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, <laughs> people's only negative comment to date, unless they hate non-abstinence yeah, specific right. approaches yeah. has been that it's too short. Um, and they're like, I want the next phase. Well, you phase. must write a follow-up. I yeah. go, there'll be a next phase. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. And so the idea for me is as soon as, I think as soon as you remove the judgment, people already get better. Mm. It's this, it's the weight that you started your journey on yeah. of, Oh, I can't say anything to anybody about this because if I say something, I'll be an alcoholic. That part probably delayed your experimentation oh, yeah. by years. Years. So for years, I was locked in this kind of inner questioning, which was just really uh, such a waste of time. Well, not a waste of time. It was obviously an essential part of where I am right now. But it was, it was but a I, time you spent in internal agony yes. unnecessarily. Yes, you could say that. Not recognizing that and not recognize it because it's not spoken of. That's why I want to have these conversations. Mm. Not recognizing that if you just removed, if the question of whether you questioning your drinking made you an alcoholic or not was removed, mm. you'd be so much freer to explore it. Exactly. And to question it. And it's interesting. I remember um, reading once that many alcoholics <laughs> describe themselves as perfectionists. And I've talked about this in the book and I'm like, if that's the opposite of the kind of image that we have of someone who 100%. has a drinking problem or a drug problem, right? It's someone lazy. who has no control, who is lazy, who's sloppy, like whatever. Um, but that really resonated with me. And I think that idea to be like, to be per- to seemingly appear perfect, to have it all together is something as well that prevented me from kind of like cracking open and just like getting into that messy, because this why, expo- it's a messy journey, yeah, right? That's why people, you're going to mess up. That's why people hide their alcohol and their boots in the closet mm. because we want to look perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why when my parents were around, I would smoke my meth in the bathroom because I didn't want to be, I wanted them to think I was all good. Mm-hmm. Not because I'm a liar, because mm. I just wanted, I wanted, I wanted to be all good and I wanted them to think that I was all good so that they wouldn't worry and they wouldn't be like they had to do anything about it. So I wouldn't bother mm-hmm. them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. And the, that image, the image of what an addict quote unquote or an alcoholic is like, is so detrimental to the whole problem. Exactly. Well, it's also just like, it's really, um, 
yeah, ignoring the fact that, like I said, we're all kind of a mess sometimes. Like none of us have got everything figured out. And I think that's what just very much part of this journey. You don't have it all figured out? <laughs> it's really do not have it all figured Damn out. It. No. That's why I wanted to do this interview. I was hoping for the answer. <laughs> Finally, someone with the answer. No, I don't have it all figured out. I've answered a lot of questions for myself though. Yeah. You know, and I, and I know a lot of people who I can who can tell me great stuff too, who I can turn to when I have questions I can't answer. And that is a really important thing. The community aspect I think is really, um, is a really important piece totally. of what people get from more, tr more kind of traditional recovery circles too. Yeah, totally. Is it Aristotle that said, the more you know, the more you know, you don't know. I don't I think know. it was him. Um, okay. but by answering a lot of my own questions, I have now completely left the door open, by the way, to every po potential possibility. Mm. And within that is also the option that one day I'll decide that I don't want to drink at all anymore. Mm. Like just because I've not taken the abstinence route to date does not mean I'm right about it. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it's the best thing for me. It just means that it's the answer that works right now. Mm -hmm. And any future option is open to me. I can any day decide I want to drink more and I can any day decide that I don't want to drink at all. And for me personally, a lot of people that I work with, the lifting of that once and for all, you have to make the choice and pick a side in this fight. Just removing that seemingly necessary component of everybody's curiosity about being sober or not has made it such a non-issue. Yeah. I remember um, I had a couple of sessions with a therapist who I didn't end up continuing seeing, but she was talking about how when she was, mainly because she talked more about herself than like asking me about me. But anyway, <laughs> she was talking about how when she gave up smoking, she kept, and she still keeps like, I don't know, 20 years later, a pack of cigarettes in her bag. And anytime she felt like a craving for it, she knew that she could have it if she, she said to her, I can have this if I want it. And yet she asked herself the question, am I choosing death or am I choosing life? And that was, mm. it was that simple for her. Wow. And she still keeps the cigarettes in her bag and she still has it available to herself as an option should she choose it. Do you keep a beer <laughs> in your... I do not. No, okay. No, although funnily enough, when we moved into a new apartment in December, in um, October last year, the people, the previous tenants had left like a beer and a couple of ciders in the refrigerator. And we were both a bit like, hmm should we throw them away? And I was like, no, someone might come around and want them. And they've just kind of sat there. And it is, a, again, it's a marker of like how Holy. far I've come. That I never even think, like I don't, I've never once have I thought, oh, there's a cider in the fridge. Totally. Sorry, that's in the UK, so just cider is alcoholic. There's a hard cider in the fridge, I have to say it oh, like that. Oh, good call. <laughs> in the UK, it's all, it's all cider. All cider is, is hard. You're, mm -hmm. like, you're like, nobody drinks apple juice. No. <laughs> Not past the age of eight. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's <laughs> hilarious. Um, which, by the way, sugar is another one of those drugs that you talked about. Meat, sugar is the same thing to me. I was addicted to sugar. I'm sure you've- I'm still probably, I think I'm still a bit addicted to sugar. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the really, really hard ones, particularly when you cut out alcohol because so much of, so many of those alcohol cravings, well, guess what? They were sugar, sugar. cravings. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so cool. So you're on a book tour. Yeah, I guess I am. Can we call it that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you're I in LA know. for. I don't know. People always say to me, are you doing a book tour? And I always had the idea that a tour would be like your publisher gives you all this money and send, sets up all these things for you. and <laughs> Pasha. <laughs> no. You were so living I'm, in like Hemingway's uh, exactly. world of writing. I'm visiting places and talking to people about this book. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love it. Isn't it? Wasn't your concept <laughs> of what being an author, because it's your second book now, mm -hmm. totally different than the reality of being mm -hmm. an author? Yeah. Very uh, different. I love somebody the other day was like, can I say poo-pooing? I'm going to say poo-pooing. Mm -hmm. Somebody was poo-pooing the fact that I'm like selling a book. They're like, you're just trying to make money off of addicts. I go, I've had that too. I go, have you not seen books for sale before? Like if you walked into a bookstore, is this the first time you've heard? What are you talking? Like there's weight loss books everywhere. Is that people trying to take advantage? It's, that's how we share knowledge. That's how we share knowledge. Yeah. So weird. And it's way cheaper than a lot of rehabs out there. Oh. <laughs> Is this a forty thousand dollar book? No, not a forty thousand dollar book. Twenty seven ninety nine. If you unless you get it on Amazon where it's probably half price. <laughs> right, totally. <Yeah. laughs> um so you're on a, you're here in LA. I'm you're, here in LA. You're gonna do a talk that by the time this comes out, it'll be after the talk. But um what else is coming up for you? What are some of the things cause my guess, once you enter into this world, like the um like the spirituality and holistic world, you don't get to leave very easily. 
No. Uh, people want to talk to you and they mm. want to share your experience, their experience with you. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing? What is up next for Sober Curious and you? Well, um, after this trip in LA, I'm going to be leading a Sober Curious retreat at Kripalu, which is a retreat center in Massachusetts. It's a very big and very well-established yoga um, and meditation center. So I'm doing a weekend retreat there to get a bit deeper into mainly people's, the, the why behind why people drink. Oh, using awesome. lots of different kind of storytelling techniques and just a two day little little oh, deep wow. dive um and then i'm going to the uk to do a couple of events there um very cool. the book's been very well received there which is fantastic and then i'm doing some talks at wanderlust in atlanta in april and at some point i'd really like a holiday in all what, of this what is that I can't, people use that word and I, it, it, I recognize it, but like, I can't quite put my finger on what I mean, it actually means. Christmas is coming in, in only like. Christmas will be coming. Yeah. On, only in about 10 months. That's so true. That's true. I can take a break there. then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm kind of leaving a bit of open space after that just to kind of see what wants to, what else wants to drop in. But generally I'm really excited about talking about this approach as much as possible. I'm really happy to have met you and find another person who's kind mm. of on this same this yeah. same similar tip, right? Yeah, and I feel like there's more of us. Mm. You know, when I started, I co-founded this treatment center called Alternatives. 2013, yeah, I think in 2013 we opened. And even back then, it was like blasphemy to suggest that mm. people were allowed to get help even if they weren't ready to quit. Like people would call us and scream at us on the phone that by giving people an option to get help without forcing them to stop drinking we were somehow threatening their life mm. completely ignoring the fact that the vast majority of people who struggle with alcohol don't ever seek help yeah it's and like, the vast majority of people who choose abstinence or pursue abstinence relapse relapse so i'm like i don't i never understood the perspective but mm. it was what i'm saying is even like six seven years ago there were not as many people in the fold as there are now mm. and um and so it's really nice to meet you too and to to connect, you know, for me, there is no one way. Mm. It's more about offering people so many options that they just automatically get drawn to one that seems relevant to them. And they go, oh, sober, I'm sober curious. Let me mm. let me see what this is about. And they read, I'd like to have better sleep, you know, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And then just pick it up and, and see. Exactly. And, and then I think also, also giving people multiple options to deal with whatever comes up when the Band-Aid is removed yeah that's another really important piece so that's the other kind of part of my work i suppose you know it's offering people spiritual tools ultimately to better understand themselves to forgive themselves to love themselves like all that good stuff that's awesome yeah um thank you so much for coming on i will see you saturday awesome because we'll be at the event and um best of luck with this book thank you for bringing this to people's awareness and doing the amazing work. I'm sure people share stories with you all the time about the impact it's had on their lives. And uh, we'll have a link to the book, all those upcoming workshops and everything else that you're doing so that people can connect with you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, do me a favor, screenshot this uh, tag, I guess the numinous end is at sober curious. There's, that, no, there's at Ruby Warrington. At Ruby Warrington. Yeah. Great. Tag us. Uh, tag at Ruby. Let us know what was the most impactful for you and share some of your stories. The, the more public you become about this, the more you talk about this in an open way, the easier it'll make your process, the easier it'll make everybody else's process who's watching from the sidelines and hasn't walked into this yet. So thanks a lot, Ruby. Thanks everybody for listening. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks and see you next week.